Okay, we're recording it. So, uh, y'all, last Tuesday, obviously I wasn't here because I was getting my test done. Uh, and so when we were here the last time, we went through chapter three. We at least went through like three, two, and three, three. We did some of that. And so let me stop sharing this part here. And I'm going to pull up the notes here. And if y'all remember, this was like the last part we were doing. And so this was like the last problem that we ended up doing right here. And so what I thought we would do tonight is continue with chapter three. And I can go over three, four, and three, five. And then if y'all have any particular questions, then we'll definitely go with that. Okay, so let me get my pen here set up. There we go. Okay. And so let's see. I want to make sure you guys can see this at home. Yes, you can. Let me do that real quick. Okay. All right. So 3.4 talks about polynomial functions, graphs, applications, and models. And so uh, what we're going to be talking about here, y'all, is when we have what we call even degree polynomials and odd degree polynomials. So let me just give you a quick example of what an even degree polynomial looks like. An even degree polynomial look, would look something like this, like say negative three X to the six, and it might have you know some other terms, right? But the leading term, the, the one with the highest power is gonna have a power that's even. That's what we mean by even degree, right? And then we would have something called an odd degree. So that would just be something like say G of X equals, I don't know, four X to the 11th, and it might have some other terms, but this would be the one that has the highest power, and that's what we call that an odd degree because the exponent is odd. Okay. So uh, let me do this. Let me kind of clean up some of this mess here, and I'm going to use some space that I have over here on the right side. I know we did this problem last week on Tuesday when we did this from home, but I am going to kind of get rid of some of this so that I have some room to put something new. Hello, hello. Okay. So let's see here. Okay, now I got some space. Okay, so what we have here, y'all, is is like this little table. And what it's talking about is what is the what we call the end behavior of the graph. What I mean by the end behavior of the graph is if we're looking at the way the graph behaves over here somewhere over here to the right or somewhere over here to the left that's what we mean by the end behavior okay and so a couple of things that we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the leading term okay so the leading term let me just write this here for us is the one that has the highest exponent okay so we're always going to be looking at the leading term. And not only are we going to look at the exponent to see if it's even or odd, we're going to look at the number in front of that term to see if it's positive or negative, okay? So look, I'm going to kind of zoom in here a little bit just so we can get a better idea of what's happening. And yes, here we go. Okay. So this part right here where it says A is greater than zero, it means that the coefficient or the number in front of that leading term is positive. And over here, when the coefficient is less than zero, that means it's negative, okay? And then the same thing is going to happen over here. So here we go. It's positive, and over here, it's going to be negative, okay? And so what I did here, y'all, is for the first couple of problems, I took this directly from our homework. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do a little stare and compare. And when you're doing this in the homework, it's going to be real straightforward. It's just going to ask you to select one of these little one of these little icons that we have here, okay? And so the icons that I'm referring to are these right here, okay? So first thing we're going to do for the first problem, I'm going to look for the leading term. So the leading term is 5x to the fifth, okay? So the first thing I know is that my exponent is odd because I'm looking at that number right there. I'm not necessarily concerned about the number in front just yet, but even when I am looking at the number in front, y'all, I don't really care 
what kind of number it is, I'm only interested in the sign of the number, okay? But in terms of my exponent, I'm always going to be looking at my exponent and determining if it's even or it's odd. So we know the exponent here happens to be odd. The second thing we're going to do, we're going to look at the sign of this number here. The sign of this number here is positive, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of look at this part right here. Look, here's my odd degree, right? And my odd degree is, and we're looking at the one that's positive. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask myself, when I look at, say, these little four pieces that I have here, and I'm looking at something that's going to look something like this one here because it's an odd degree, then it's positive. Look at what I circled here, y'all, and look at the four little parts here, and I'll label them like this, like one, two, three, and four. The one that I circled, does it look more like, and, and all I'm doing, y'all, I'm just looking at the end parts of the graph. Again, what I mean by the end parts of the graph, y'all, let me, let me do it like this. I'm just looking at this, these parts. So knowing that we have an odd degree and knowing that it's positive, it's the one that I circled, compared to like the little one, two, three, four, what I circled, does it look more like one, two, three, or four? What do you all think if you're looking at here at the picture? Anybody know? So look the way it is on the right. On the right side, the graph is going up, and on the left side, the graph is going down. Between one, two, three, and four, which one has on the left going down and on the right side going up. What do you all think? I'll even zoom in a little bit better so you can see. Between one, two, three, and four, which one looks like it is going, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, it's going uh, up on the right and down on the left. From your perspective, there you go. Up on the right and down on the left. Which one looks it? One, two, three, or four? What do you think? Four, right? Okay. So then all I'm going to do, y'all, is I'm going to do this. When you do this on your homework, that's all you're doing. You're just going to pick which one it is. It's like one of those multiple choice ones where you kind of have to drag the graph or whatever, or you got to select one. The homework is going to be very similar to this. Okay. You're going to pick one of those one, two, three, or four. Okay. So look, let's take a look at the next problem here, and I'm going to call this one here number two. And the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to look for the leading term. So the leading term, y'all, is the one that has the highest exponent. So it's that one right there. It's a negative x to the third. So the first thing I notice, my exponent is odd. The second thing I notice is the number in front is negative. So that's going to be more like this one over here. Okay, and again, if I look at one, two, three, and four, which one is up on the left and down on the right between one, two, three, and four? Anybody know? So if I'm looking at the picture here, right? It is up on the left hand side and down on the right hand side. Number three, right? There you go. So then all we're going to do is draw that little picture. It goes like this and like that. Okay. And we'll do a couple of these out, and I'll even pull a problem directly from the homework so you can kind of see what it looks like. But this is really all I'm doing. I'm just trying to figure out what does that behavior look like, okay? And I'm, the way I'm doing that is I'm determining, number one, is the exponent even or odd? And then number two, is the sign of the number in front positive or negative, okay? So let's take a look at the third one. Okay, leading term is this one right here, 10x to the sixth. So again, first thing I notice, my exponent is even, and the number in front of it is positive. So if I come over here and I look at which one has even degrees, this, this kind of little box right over here, right? So this one has an even degree, and look, when the number in front of this positive, it's going to look up on the left side and up on the right side, so it would look like a lot like number one. So then my answer for this one would go something like, something like this. And that's all I'm doing. I'm just picking whichever one it is, okay? 
All right, and so look, we got one more here, number four. So remember, y'all, the leading term is the one with the highest exponent. Not always the one in front, but just the one with the highest exponent. So in this case, we have a negative 10x to the power 4. So again, the first thing I notice, my exponent is even. My coefficient is negative. And so it's going to look more like this one right here. So my graph is going to go down this way and down that way, okay? And so let me pull up a problem directly from the homework. Let's see if I can get my mouse to work. Here we go. This way and... So I'm going to pull question number one, y'all, directly from my homework, and I'll paste it. You guys can see exactly what's happening here. Um, copy this here. And come back to our notes. Okay. So what I'm going to do here, y'all, here is my question. In Okay, so this is my question number one out of my homework. Again, I copied and pasted it directly from from my lab so you guys can see it. Here you go. Okay, I'm just coming up. Okay, so it says describe the end behavior of the graph of the polynomial function. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to look for the leading term. So there is my leading term, 5x to the fifth. Okay, so the first thing I notice, my exponent here, y'all, is odd. The next thing I notice is that this number here is greater than zero, which means it's positive, okay? And so when the number here is odd, my exponent is odd, and my leading coefficient is positive, all I'm going to do, y'all, I'm just going to scroll back over here, and I'm going to say, okay, look, we're looking at an odd degree. Let me clean this up here. Okay, so we're looking at the odd degree, so it's going to be one of these. And we want the coefficient to be positive. So look, on the right side, it's going up. And on the left side, it's going down. So the right side's going up, the left side's going down. So when I come back to my original problem, right side's going up, left side's going down. I'm just going to pick choice A. And I got it done, right? So you can see that that's basically how I'm going to be doing all the problems in, in my assignment here, okay? So give me one second, guys. I want to see if I can get my mouth to work. It's giving me some problems. Okay. Try one more thing and I'll... Don't worry, y'all. Let's come back on. Okay, now it's back on here. Now back on here. Okay, so let me keep scrolling here. And actually, you know what? Those of you who are watching at home, let's do it like this. So let me stop sharing this part here. Oops, I heard something in the chat box. You made it good. I'm glad you got here, Lada. Uh, let's see. So let me do this. Let me stop sharing this part here, y'all. And let's try doing the entire screen so we can get this thing to work. I know that looks a little rough. And we come over here. So we said our choice was A. We're going to check it. And we got it, right? Okay, so let's do that. Let's go ahead and come back to the next part here. Okay, so it says the graphs in figure 25 suggest that for every polynomial function f of odd degree, there's at least one real value of x that satisfies f of x equals 0. It says the real zeros correspond to the x-intercepts. 
Okay, so we're going to talk, last time on the last Tuesday, we, we talked about how do we find the zeros of a polynomial. In terms of the graph, what the zero is, the zero are just the x-intercepts, okay? And so what we're going to be talking about is how do we find the zeros, and the zeros just correspond to the, um, to the x-intercepts, okay? So one thing I want to mention is, uh, let's see. When, when we're looking at these graphs, and I'm going to try to show you an example. Let's see. Here we go. So when I look at, say, this, this first picture here, y'all, on the left-hand side, the graph kind of comes up, hits it right there, comes back down, goes back up. Okay, so when the graph crosses all the way through, that means that that x-intercept is going to happen one time, meaning I'm going to have, uh, in this case, we have three x-intercepts. But if you notice, they just kind of pass through the x-axis, right? And then if you look at, say, this one over here on the right side, if you notice this graph, see over here how it comes down, it hits it, and it bounces off? When this happens, uh, when this happens here, y'all, this x-intercept is going to happen twice. So I'm going to say it's going to happen two times. Anytime it hits the graph and it bounces off, it's going to ha that x-intercept will occur two times, okay? And uh, and so let me kind of show you what I'm going to get to, and then we have some even degrees here. All that means again is just referring to the highest exponent, okay? So um, so again, like right here, since it bounces off, I know that one's going to occur twice, okay? So how, like these here, the the uh, graph actually crosses all the way through, like it goes down, it comes up, it goes down, it comes up, it actually crosses through. Each of those will occur one time. Okay. So let me show you what I'm going to get to. So let's see. Here we go. Okay. So for my problem here, it says find the polynomial function f of at uh, least degree having the graph shown. Okay. So what we know is we're going to have one, two, three x intercepts. Okay. Those x-intercepts, y'all, are what we call the zeros of the function. So one of them is x equals negative 6, one of them is x equals 2, and one of them is x equals 5. And I'm just doing that because I'm just looking at the picture, right? One's at negative 6, one's at 2, one's at 5. That's where the graph crosses through those points. So we kind of went over a little bit something similar to this last week. And we said, look, if those are the x-intercepts, so those are the zeros, then the factors we're going to have I'm going to write it so it looks like this. I'm going to bring that negative 6 over. I'm going to bring this 2 over, and I'm going to bring this 5 over. So that's going to be an x plus 6. This is going to be an x minus 2. And this is going to be an x, uh, x minus 5. Okay? So when I start to write out my polynomial, it's going to look like this. A, and then x plus 6, x minus 2, and x minus 5. Okay, so what I want to point out is, look, we've already used this point, this point, and this point. The one point we haven't used yet is that point right there, right? So we're going to use that point now. So remember, when we have this 0, 30, remember, the, the 0 refers to the x, so 30 refers to the y, okay? So just a reminder, y'all, f of x is really the same thing as the y coordinate, right? So the y, where the y used to be, I'm going to put the number 30. What I'm going to do is I'm going to see if we can solve this equation for the letter A. Now, where the x used to be, I'm going to put zeros all right here. So I'm going to put a 0 plus 6, a 0 minus 2, and a 0 minus 5. Okay. And so now I'm going to have 30 equals, let's see, A. 0 plus 6 is still 6. Uh, 0 minus 2 is a negative 2, and 0 minus 5 is a negative 5. And so we're going to go 30 equals, let's see, uh, let's see, negative 2 times 5 is a positive 10, times 6 is a 60, with an A. And now I want to solve for A, so I'm going to divide both sides by 60. And I'm coming up with, we can reduce that to one half, okay? So now that we have that part, what we're going to do is we're going to come back over here, y'all, and where that A used to be, 
we're going to put the number one half. Okay. And we're done. So when we were when we did our session y'all last week on Tuesday night when we did it online. Uh, one of the things that we had to do was it said, like, don't factor it. So we actually had to multiply the whole thing out. The nice thing about this problem here, y'all, you can leave it in the factored form. You don't actually have to, like, multiply it from, at that point, okay? So in this problem here, the one that we just did right here, and then I'm going to kind of scroll back up, y'all, and I know I erased it because I needed some room today. But I think we probably had part of it somewhere here. Here we go. So we were doing this problem. This was the one that we had done the other day. And I know I erased a whole bunch of it because I needed some room today. But when we got to this step here, we ended up having to multiply the whole thing out. The only difference in the problem that we did right now in this one, this one here on my screen, I had to multiply the whole thing out. This one here, we can leave it in the fact of form. But it's asking me the same exact question, okay? The, the thing it's trying to make the connection here, y'all, is that my zeros happen to be the same thing as my x and x in terms of the graph, okay? So we know what, what to do when we have zeros. Well, we're just reapplying that same principle to when we have x intercepts because they really mean the same thing, okay? So look, let's try the next one. We're going to go about it the same exact way. So I'm going to look at my problem here, and I'm going to say, okay, we're still trying to find the polynomial, right? And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, I see an x-intercept right there, and I see another one right here. But remember when I told you all a little bit that when the graph hits it and it bounces off, it means this one is going to occur two times or it's going to occur twice? So all that means is when I start to write out my x-intercepts, I'm going to say, look, x equals negative 5. I'm going to put x equals 3, and I'm going to write it again. And the reason why it's occurring twice is because how it hits it and it bounces off. Anytime it hits it and bounces off and it doesn't actually cross through the x-axis, it means it's going to occur twice. Okay? So look, just like we did before, I'm going to write it like this. Look, here are my zeros. So let's write our factors. Okay. So remember, my factors are now going to be, I'm going to bring that negative 5 over. That's going to become an x plus 5. I'm going to bring this 3 over. That's going to become a minus 3 and the same thing on the other. Okay. Now, when I start to write this out, it's going to look like this. f of x equals some leading coefficient, some number a. I don't know what it is yet. x plus 5. And if we want to, we can write it as x minus 3 squared. Okay. So you know, just like we did before, we need to use this point right here. So remember, in this point right here, y'all, the x stands for 0 and the y stands for 9. And remember, the y and the f of x are really the same thing, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put a 9 equals a, where the x used to be, y'all. I'm putting the number 0. So 0 plus 5, 0 minus 3 squared. 0 plus 5 is 5. Uh, 0 minus 3 is a negative 3, but that's being squared. So this is 5 times negative 3 when I score it is 9. 5 times 9 is 45. Okay. And so now I need to solve for a, so I'm going to go ahead and just divide both sides by 45. And again, I'm going to get a fraction, but that's okay. 9 over 45 reduces to 1 over 5. Okay. And now, y'all, all we're going to do is we're going to rewrite our problem. But instead of me writing the letter A, we're going to use 1 over 5. And again, when you're doing this in the homework, y'all, you don't have to worry about factoring it out or multiplying it all out. You can leave it in that factored form. 
So I always like doing this, these problems compared to the other ones, because the other one, it was one extra step I had to do with multiplying everything out. This one, I don't have to do that, but I'm doing really the same exact thing that we did the other day. The main thing, y'all, is just when you're looking at the graph, being able to recognize that if when the graph hits the x-axis, if it does that little bounce, to understand that that's gonna occur twice, okay? All right. So let me keep scrolling through here. I don't know if we've got any more. Yes, we got another one here. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing we did before. I'm going to zoom in here, y'all, and I'm going to find my polynomial, okay, just by looking at the picture. So first thing I notice is I have two x-intercepts. But again, just like we said before, since this x-intercept, it hits it and it bounces off, and it hits it and it bounces off. That means that each of those are going to occur So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, what are my x-intercepts? One of them is x equals negative 3, but it's going to occur twice. So I'm going to put 2 negative 3, and then the other one is x equals positive 3, but that one is going to occur again twice. Okay. So now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look, let me write out my factors. So when I bring that negative 3 over, it's going to become an x plus 3. Same thing over here. When I bring these threes over, they're going to become minus three, right? Because we're crossing the equal sign. Okay. So now, when I write out my polynomial, it's going to look like this. F of x equals a. Since I have x plus three twice, I'm going to write out this deal. x plus three squared. Same thing with the other one, x minus three squared. Okay. Now, just like we've been doing before, we have this point up here, and we got to use it. Remember, that's my x, and that's my y. So where my y used to be, I'm going to put the number 81 equals a. x is the number 0, so 0 plus 3 squared, and 0 minus 3 squared. So 0 plus 3 is 3, and 0 minus 3 is a negative 3. Okay. Let's see, 3 when I square it is going to give me 9, and negative 3 when I square it is also going to give me 9. And I know 9 times 9 is 81. So when we solve for A by dividing both sides by 81, y'all, let's see, 81 divided by 81 is just, it's just one, right? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over here to this problem right here. And everywhere I have an A, I'm going to replace it with a number one. So f of x, I don't really need to write the one if you don't want to. You can write it like this. x plus 3 squared and x minus 3 squared. And you got it. Am I making sense how I'm doing these? We're doing okay so far? Yeah, just checking the video. Had you had any of you guys already gone through 3.4? I don't know. I Okay. Yeah. So I was going through it because I wasn't sure if you guys had done it. But if you guys have questions, let me know. I don't wanna I don't wanna go through if you all have questions. Which was your question? Number seven? Okay, so look. Uh-huh. Okay, so look, let's take a look at number seven. So guys, I'm gonna do number seven, and I want y'all to notice something, like here's my number seven, let me copy and paste this. And yeah, I didn't. I was doing that because I wasn't sure how many of y'all had had a chance to go through any of that, that's why I was covering that. But if you guys had, then yeah, I definitely wanna take time to answer questions. Okay, so look, I'm gonna do it right over here. There we go, okay. So I want you to notice this graph here, y'all, looks almost like the one that we just did. It looks like it's just kind of flipped over, right? Okay, so look. We got two x-intercepts, right? One of them is x equals negative 3. It occurs twice. The other one is x equals positive 3. It occurs twice. So my factors are going to be x plus 3, x plus 3, 
x minus 3, x minus 3. And so when we start to write this thing out, it should look like this. x plus 3 squared, x minus 3 squared, right? Okay, so now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to say, look, we got to use this point right here. Remember, that's my x and that's my y. So a negative 81 equals a 0 plus 3 squared, 0 minus 3 squared. Okay, so 0 plus 3 is still 3. 0 minus 3 is a negative 3. Let's see, so I'm coming up with 3 squared is 9, and negative 3 squared is a positive 9 as well. So this is negative 81 equals 81 with an A. So when we divide both sides by 81, I'm coming up with A equals negative 1. Does your picture look anything like this one? But the, the numbers are still, the x-intercepts are the same ones, though? Yeah, but except down here you have a negative 64. Okay, so we'll, we'll do yours real quick, too. But this is what I'm coming up with for mine, right? So then right here, y'all, all I would do is say, look, I'm going to come back here, and instead of putting an A, I'm going to put a negative 1. So I would write mine, so it, so it looks like this, f of x equals negative, and then I would just put x plus 3 squared, x minus 3 squared. And that's what I would write on mine. And I'm actually going to put that in here. And then we'll do yours too, just to make sure we're coming up with the same thing. So I have a negative, and then parentheses, x oops, plus 3 squared, and then x minus 3 squared. Here we go. And I'm going to check it, and we got it, right? And then you said yours down here, it was 0 and negative 64? Okay. So if that's what you have, then this is what I would do. I would put a negative 64, but the x-intercepts ended up being the same, right? We would have an 81a. So when we divide both sides by 81, uh, all you're going to have, Aridai, is a negative 64 over 81 for your A. So on yours, what you would write is you would write f of x equals negative 64 over 81, and then everything else would look the same. x plus 3 squared, x minus 3 squared. Boom. And that's what yours should look like if you do it. Did it work? Huh? You forgot the tooth? That's what it was? There you go. Okay, good, good, good. Did, uh, did any of y'all have any other questions from 3.4? Yes, ma'am. It still says it's wrong? Uh, okay, give me one quick second. Let me do this real quick. So... Let's see. Okay, let me try something here. Oops. So, guys, I'm going to stop sharing this part here. Robert, you got it. Good. I'm glad you're able to join in. And so, let me do. Okay. So, let's go like this. And. Uh, you know why, Aridai, your x-intercepts, aren't they at 4 and negative 4? Oh, negative, I'm sorry, uh, uh, negative 4 and positive 2?
Yeah. So look, I'm gonna. So what I did here, I pulled up. I pulled up your actual problem, and so I'm gonna put your problem up here, so you can see what it is I'm looking at. Let me go like this. Let me copy this here. Okay. And I'll tell you what I'll do. Come back over here, and let's go like that. And let me do this here. And let's see. Let's go like this. We need that. That. And over here, those of you who are watching from home, you need to just share the screen. And okay, let's go like this. Okay, so this is when I, I went to your account and I was able to, this is the picture that I was able to pull up. Does your picture look like this? Okay, so first thing I would say is if I'm looking at this picture, wouldn't this one here be x equals negative four? You see what I mean? Yeah. And then wouldn't that one be at two? Does that make more sense? Yeah. yeah. So can, can you do it from there? Or do you want me to go through it? Are you good? No, You're good then? Okay. Just wanted to double check. Okay. So let's see. Um, those of you who are here today in class and those of you who are even watching at home. Uh, I, so I wasn't sure, y'all, how much, how much those of you were able to do from the homework. But those of you who are at home and those of you who are here, do you all have any particular questions out of, say, 3.4 or 3.5 you want me to do? I mean, we, what we covered right now, y'all, we did all of 3.4. And I can go over 3.5, but if you've already done, if you've already done the lecture, like if you've already watched the video on 3.5 and you've already done some of that, uh, I don't want to necessarily take your time doing that. I would rather answer questions that you guys might have. So if you have questions from 3.4, if you have questions from 3.5, I can do that. If you want me to go through 3.5, I can do that as well. So I'll do it like this. Uh, uh, questions? We'll go like this. And so those of you who are watching from home, uh, choice A is I, I'll answer questions from homework. Choice B is I'll go over 3.5, so I have one vote for B. I'll let the, uh, Laura and Roberto, I'll let you guys vote as well. And then those of you who are here with us today, uh, if you guys want, I can definitely go over 3.5 as well. Uh, so, on one of the problems from 3.5? Okay, so I'll tell you what. I'm going to answer your question first, and then I'll go over 3.5. And uh, and then, guys, if you all have any particular questions, please let me know. And if you want, look, we will probably still have time. I can do the chapter four as well, because I want to say that for next week, y'all. Uh, let me see. I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing the screen already. Uh, let's see. Let's go like this. Uh, yes, sir, Robert. I saw that you had your hand up. Yeah, I'm um, B. I, I vote for B. Sorry, my, my volume is off. That's my bad. I vote for B. Okay, you vote for B also? Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry, I had my, my volume off. Okay, B. Okay, yeah. So, look, I tell you what we're going to do, y'all. Um, one, one of our students here in class has already gone through 3.5, so she has a question on her homework. I'm going to do that first, and then I'll go through 3.5, okay? So we'll be able to do both, but but definitely go through 3.5 as well. So let me do this. Let me share my screen with you guys so you guys can see what I'm looking at. Let's go like this and like this and like this. Okay, and Arida, what was your which question did you have? Uh-huh. The third part of it? Okay. So uh, the question was, y'all, from 3.5, she was doing number three, and there's a part three to that question. And is it, does your question look something like this? Okay. So I'm going to show you guys how we're going to go ahead and go about this one here, y'all, okay? So uh, let me, give me one second, and we'll do this here, okay? So let me copy this. And I'm going to paste this over here in my notes. Okay. So uh, let's see, y'all. So the first part of the question says, give any equations of any vertical, horizontal, or oblique asymptotes for the graph of the rational function. 
Okay, so uh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how to go about doing this, but the one thing I did not cover in the notes is how do we find oblique asymptotes. I'm going to show you how to do it, y'all. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this problem from the homework, okay, so that it's y'all don't have to go through it. You don't even have to worry about it. Okay, so y'all, first thing we're going to talk about are these things called vertical asymptotes, okay? And and again, I'm going to go through this, y'all, in the notes as well. But I'm just going to kind of show you with this particular problem. Okay, so vertical asymptotes, y'all, occur when the denominator is equal to zero. So the first thing I'm going to do here, I'm going to take this x plus 3, that's my denominator. I'm going to set it equal to zero, and I'm going to get x equals negative 3. So right here, y'all, I would just put x equals negative 3, okay? So let me do this, y'all, so that those of you who are at home can, can see this as well. Uh, I'm actually going to pull up the actual homework problem so you guys can see this. So let me stop sharing this part here. Let me share the whole screen. And there it goes. And it looks real rough. But here we go. Okay. So right here, y'all, I'm just going to put x equals, we said, negative 3. I'm going to check it. We got it. Okay. Now, the next part of the question, part B, or the second part says, what's the equation of the horizontal asymptote? So let me show you how I'm going to do this part right here. Okay, so let me copy this here, and I'm going to paste this back over here in my notes. So those of you who are watching can see this. Okay, horizontal asymptote. So guys, there's. I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to show you how we're going to find the horizontal asymptote. So let me see. There should be something in here about horizontal asymptotes. I just got to look for it. Okay. If um, right here under, under number two, it says, if the numerator has a lesser degree than the denominator, then the horizontal asymptotes can be y equals zero. And if the degrees are the same, it's going to be the fraction of the lean coefficient. So let me explain what that means. I'm going to come back to my problem here. And I'm going to look at what we call the degree of the top and the degree of the bottom. So the degree of the top, y'all, is actually 2 because that's the highest exponent and the degree of the bottom is 1. If the degree on the top is higher than that of the bottom, then we don't have any horizontal asymptote. So my choice here would be B, okay? I'm not going to have a horizontal asymptote. And again, if you're watching from home, I'm going to click on B. I'm going to check my answer and we should be good, okay? Now, there's a third part, and the third part says, what is what we call the oblique asymptote? And y'all, I didn't cover this in the notes, so I am gonna pull this problem from your homework so that you don't have a problem like this. And let me come back to my notes, and right here, okay. So what do we, what we call the oblique asymptote? The way we do this, y'all, is my original function looked like this, uh, x squared minus 3 over x plus 3, okay? The way we do this is, do y'all remember when we first started doing synthetic division, we did something called long division first, and when we did long division, it looked like this, like x squared, and then I don't have an x term, y'all, so I'm going to put a 0x, so I'm going to put a minus 3 right here. And then on the outside, I'm going to put an x plus 3. And what we did when we did long division that very first day, we only did one problem like that, is we said, look, here I have an x squared and here I have an x. So what do I need to multiply x by to get x squared? And we said, look, we got to multiply by x. So x times x is x squared. x times 3 is a 3x. And then what we did is we said, now we got to come through and we got to subtract. So we're going to change our signs. So this one and this one will cancel. Uh, 0 minus 3x would be a minus 3x. And then I'm going to bring down my minus 3. And then I would do the same thing. I would say, look, what do I need to multiply x by to get a negative 3x? And we'd say, look, we could multiply it by a negative 3. So negative 3 times x is a negative 3x. 
and negative three times um, positive three is a negative nine, okay? And then we're gonna subtract, so we're gonna change those signs. And so these are gonna cancel, and here we're gonna end up with a six. And so what we would say is we said, look, we could write this polynomial so it looks like this. X minus three, and then plus six over whatever we were dividing it by, which was X plus three. So the oblique asymptote y'all refers to that part of the long division. We could have done it using synthetic division too, but usually they do it using long division because we can't always do synthetic, but in this case we could have. But this is what they refer to as the oblique asymptote, the part without the remainder, okay? So what I would do over here is I would say y equals x minus three. And again, if you're watching from home, right here, I'm gonna put x minus three, x minus three, and I'm gonna hit enter, and we got it, okay? But I didn't cover that in the notes. So guys, I'm gonna pull this problem from your homework. So give me one second, por favor. Those of you who are watching from home, give me one second and let me do this. Here we go. It was 3.5. Remove the question. And it was number three. So let's get rid of that one. Remove it. There we go. Okay. So guys, I did pull number three out of 3.5 from your homework. So if you are watching, um, I just did that right now. Let me come back to my notes. There we go. Okay, so I pulled it, guys, because I didn't cover it. Uh, but what I am going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and go over uh, 3.5 rational functions, graph applications, models. And so, okay, rational function, y'all, is just a fraction where the top and the bottom happen to be polynomials, okay? So that's what we have right here. Uh, vertical asymptotes, y'all, vertical asymptotes are what make the denominator equal to zero, okay? So vertical asymptotes are whatever makes the bottom part zero, and then we have these things called horizontal asymptotes, okay? We are going to talk about vertical and horizontal. I, I did pull the problem that asked you about the OB. Okay, so the first problem here, the first part here says, what happens if the numerator has a lesser degree of the denominator? Let me tell you what this means. I'm just going to make this up. Suppose this is an x squared minus 5, and suppose this is an x to the third minus 1. If the power on the top is smaller than the one on the bottom, then the vertical, I'm sorry, the horizontal asymptote is going to be this line, y equals 0. And as long as the one on the top is smaller than the one on the bottom, it doesn't matter how much smaller, as long as the one on the top is smaller. Okay. Now, part B says, what happens if they have the same degree? So let me explain to you what I mean by that. So if I have a 3x squared minus 5x plus 2, and we have, say, a 5x squared minus 11x minus 13, we're going to say, look, they have the same degree, right? They're both x squared. What we do is we take this fraction, and we're going to say our horizontal asymptote is going to be 3 over 5. It's going to be the, the leading coefficient of the top divided by the leading coefficient of the bottom. So you got to look at the x squareds and take the numbers in front of them and write it as a fraction. And as that happens when they're the same, okay? And then when the one on the bottom is smaller, that's when we have an oblique, but I, again, I pulled that problem from your homework. So we're going to be looking at whether the one on the top is smaller or when they're both the same, okay? So let's go through a couple of problems. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on. So the questions here say, for each rational function, find horizontal or vertical asymptotes. Okay, so first thing we're going to do, y'all, we're going to look for the horizontal asymptotes. The first thing I'm looking at is... I notice that the degree of the top, meaning the highest power of x upstairs and the highest power of x downstairs are both ones, right? And then what we're looking at is we're looking at the term in front of them, the numbers in front of them. So then we would say a horizontal asymptote, my ha, is going to be y equals this fraction right here, 1 over 1, 
is just one. Okay? That's how we find our horizontal asymptote. Now, let's see if we can find the vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote, we take a look at the bottom part. And to find the vertical asymptote, we take the bottom part and we set it equal to zero. And here's my vertical asymptote. And it's just going to be x equals negative 1. Okay? So this is how I'm finding my horizontal and my vertical asymptotes. The horizontal says, take a look at the power of the highest power in the top, highest power in the bottom, and then we have to figure something out from there. And the vertical asymptote always says, take the bottom part, set it equal to zero, there's your vertical asymptote. Okay. So look, let's try the same thing here. First thing I'm going to do, y'all, look at the power of x on the top. It's a 1. Look at the power of x on the bottom. It's also a 1. So they're the same. So my horizontal asymptote, my ha, is going to be the fraction of those numbers right there. 4 over 2, which is just... Anytime they're on the one on the top and the one on the bottom are the same, we just take that fraction. Okay. Now, let's find the vertical asymptote. We take a look at the bottom part, and we always set it equal to zero. So when I move that 6 over, it's going to be 2x equals 6. We divide both sides by 2. That gives me x equals 3. Okay. So we found our horizontal asymptote, we found our vertical asymptote. All right. We're going to do the same thing here with the bottom one. Okay. When I look at the highest power of x here, that tells me since there's no x, the degree is 0. And when I look at the highest power of x there, I can see the degree is 2. So now i got to figure out, okay, they're not the same. What do I do? I'm going to come back to my notes real quick, y'all. And if the numerator has a lesser degree than the denominator, then y equals 0 is going to be my horizontal asymptote. Okay? So from this one here, since the one at the top is smaller than the bottom, it's always going to be y equals 0. Now, let's find our vertical asymptote. Remember, we're going to take the bottom part. We're going to go x squared minus 5 equals 0. Okay? So I'm going to move this 5 over. That's going to give me x squared equals 5. And then we're going to take the square root on both sides. So we're actually going to end up with two numbers, x equals 5 and x equals the negative square root of 5. If you want to, y'all, you can write it like this. Just understand that there really are two values there, right? One of them is a positive square root of 5, one of them is a negative. Okay? But that's all we're doing. We're just taking that bottom part and we're setting them equal to 0. Okay? Now, there's a, another part here in 3.5, y'all, and I'm going to explain what this part here means. Okay? So, <clears throat> these functions here, y'all, this is kind of like what the graphs of these functions look like. They look very similar to this right here. And, and remember, we talk about these things called vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes. So let me kind of explain the idea of what, what's going on here. So number one, a vertical asymptote, y'all, is going to be a vertical line. Okay. So if you look at the four pictures that I have here, I see there's a vertical line here. There's one here. There's one here, and there's one right there as well. Okay. So that's what vertical asymptotes do. The vertical asymptote, I'm going to kind of like say pick my first graph. If I look at my first graph right here, y'all, you can notice that this graph gets really, really close to that line, but it never actually touches it. That's what the idea of an asymptote is. The graph gets really, really close, but it never actually touches that line, right? Same thing happens with this one, too. Like, if you notice over here, uh, the graph is getting really, really close to this line. The graph is getting really, really close to that line, but it never actually crosses it, okay? Those are what, what uh, vertical asymptotes do. Horizontal asymptotes, y'all, do the same thing, except they are horizontal ones, okay? So, 
wherever we have our vertical asymptotes, so if I start looking at these things and I say, okay, like if I were to look at the first one, and I would say, what's my vertical asymptote here? We would say our vertical asymptote is x equals 3, right? And if I were to look at this one right here, I would say, hey, this one also has a vertical asymptote at x equals 3. And if I were to look at, say, this one over here, this one also has a vertical asymptote of x equals 3. And if I were to look at this one over here, this one would say this one has a vertical asymptote of x equals, not 3, but 0 because that's where that kind of dotted line kind of looks like, right? Okay, the domain. Remember what the domain refers to. The domain refers to what kind of numbers can I plug in for x? Remember what the vertical asymptote is? The vertical asymptote is the value of x that makes the bottom part zero. Well, we never want to have the bottom part being zero. So this domain says, look, we're going to take everything from negative infinity to 3, and then we're going to pull the number 3 out. We're going to take, so like here's my number line. I'll do it this way. So hey, 0, 1, 2, say that's the number 3, 4, 5. What they kind of did here is they said, look, here was the number 3, and we took the number 3 out of it, right? So this one has... A domain of negative infinity to to three because that is one of the vertical asymptotes. So is this one here. That's also one of the vertical asymptotes. So that's why the domain is from negative infinity to three because three makes the bottom part zero, and we cannot have the bottom part being zero. Same thing for this one. Now, if you look at graph for D. See how there's a little open circle right here? That means they're, they're not using the number 3. But you know what other number they're not using? They're not using 0 as well. And this one doesn't say that, right? So my choice, my answer for this question would be choices A, B, and C. Because they all have vertical asymptotes, meaning they all have a value of x equals 3, and that part makes the bottom part 0, and we can't have that. And that's why we had to pull that number out. This one has it as well, but there's another number they needed to pull out. They needed to pull out zero, and this part doesn't do that. That's why my choices for, or my answer for this one here would be choices A, B, and C. And let's see. Uh, which choices have a range? Okay, so now, y'all, the range. Remember what the range refers to? The range refers to the Y value, right? So my y values are going to go from negative infinity to 0 and 0 to infinity. So I'm going to think about looking at my y values. And when I'm coming up on the y-axis, I'm going to be coming up all the way. And when I hit 0, i got to leave an open spot. Okay. So let's take a look at, say, the first graph. Okay, I'm coming up from the bottom. So I'm coming up all the way from negative infinity, right? Do you see how the graph kind of does, you know, they don't really show me that much of it, but the graph kind of does, supposed to do something like that. And I'm going to erase that a little bit because I put a little bit too much that I wanted to. It's supposed to look something like this. And as I'm coming up from the bottom, we don't actually hit this point. We kind of skip over it, and if I'm going up, so what does that mean? If I keep going to the right, I'm always going to hit my graph. And if I'm going to the right here or to the left here, I'm going to hit my graph. But a horizontal asymptote says the graph gets really, really close to that line, but it never actually touches it. So I know we can't see it here, but the way the graph is shaped, this is telling me that there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So when I'm looking at my question right here, which one has a choice of range negative infinity to 0? So far, I would say, well, choice A does. I need to see if do any of the other ones, okay? So look, I'm going to do the same thing for choice B. I'm going to come up here. And as I'm coming up, notice how I can still hit that right at zero. So choice B would not be one of my choices because my, my horizontal asymptote, y'all, would have to occur right here. And theirs is all the way up there. Okay. Now, when I look at choice D, or C, I'm sorry, and I come up from the bottom, they do have a horizontal asymptote at zero, because notice how the graph has those little lines that kind of does that number. 
But if I'm down here at the bottom, I'm never going to hit my graph. Okay, so choice C would be a choice for me. And the same thing for D for that same reason. As I'm coming this way here, or I'm coming this way here, my graph does that number. I do have a horizontal asymptote of zero, but I don't, I'm never hitting my graph down here. So the only one that I would choose for this one, y'all, would be choice A. Okay. And I think that is all of chapter three. Okay. So uh, give me one quick second, y'all. I'm going to pull something up here so you guys can see. Let me see. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Week nine. So who are we doing week nine? We have also have four one, and then in week 10, what do we got in week 10? We got uh, four two rules of exponents, 4.3. Okay, so guys, we still got about 45 minutes. So why don't we go through uh, at least 4.1, and then next week, if y'all want, I can answer some questions out of 4.2, 4 rules of exponents, 4.3, uh, but we do have plenty of time, so I wanna make sure that I'm able to answer some of those questions for you guys. So let me pull up the notes from chapter four. And we can go over some of this here. Let's see. And I'll get to your, I, I heard something in the chat. So give me one second, y'all. And here we go. Let's go like this. And then print page. Let's print this guy out. Bring all of this down, kind of down. Here we go. Okay, so let me see. I heard something in the chat. Let me come back over here. And let's see. Ah, okay. Okay. No, no problem, Lada. No problem. All right. So y'all, let's go through through 4.1 just to make sure again we can make sense out of this stuff here. Uh 4.1 talks about these things called inverse functions, okay? And so the first thing we're going to talk about are excuse me, our one-to-one -one functions. So it says a function f is one is a one-to-one -one function if for its elements a and b in the domain, uh, if a and b are different, then f of a and f and b are different. Okay. So you know, when we first start talking about functions, we had something called the vertical line test. And the vertical line test said if you drew a vertical line, if you only hit the graph at one point, then it was not a function. Now we have something called the horizontal line test. Horizontal line test says your function is one to one. If when you draw a horizontal line, horizontal lines y'all, oh come on, Ken. Horizontal lines y'all go from left to right. Okay. If you only hit the graph once, then we have a one to one function. So look, I'm going to draw my line. How many times did I hit it? Just once. How many times did I hit it? Just once. So this function here, y'all, is what we call one to one. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to do the second one, right? So I'm going to do the second one. I draw it right here. How many times did I hit it? I hit it twice. We're going to say it is not one to one. Okay, let me see. I heard something in the chat. Oh, uh, uh, let's see. Oh, can't see. Sorry about that, y'all. My bad. Here we go. Okay, so again, if I'm drawing a horizontal line, if I hit it only once, it's one-to-one. -one. If I hit it more than once, it's not one-to-one. -one. And somebody might say, what happens if you draw this horizontal line where you only hit it right there? I'll draw this one here where I hit it more than once. Okay, so as long as I can find one line that's going to mess it up, it's not one-to-one. -one. So look, let's try the same thing for the next one. Let's go this way. Oh, notice we only hit it once. We only hit it once. This is a one to one function. And then one more time, this one here is not one to one. Okay, so as long as you can draw a horizontal line that hits it at more than one point, it's not a one to one function. If you only hit it once, it is one to one. Okay, so we're going to have, we're going to find these things y'all called inverse functions. 
So it says, let f be a one-to-one -one function, then g is the inverse of f if g composed with, uh, I'm sorry, if f composed with g of x is equal to x for every x in the domain of g, and if g composed with f of x is equal to x for every x in the domain of f. Okay, so let's take a look here. We're going to find two things. We're going to find f of 2, and we're going to find g of 7. Okay, so look, we're going to go slow. We already know how to find f of 2. We're going to take this function here, y'all, everywhere we have an x. We're going to put the number 2. So 2 to the third we know is 8, and 8 minus 1 we know is 7. Okay. And so now we're going to find g of 7. So g of 7 says we're going to come to this function here, and everywhere we have the uh, number x, we're going to put, or the letter x, I'm sorry, we're going to put the number 7. Okay, so we have what we call the cubic root of 8. Okay, so we haven't really talked about cubic roots a whole lot, so we're going to talk about them a little bit now. So guys, before I go on, let me show you the idea of square roots. So if I ask you, what's the square root of 49? My guess is you're going to say, you know, it's 7. And if I asked you why, you would say, well, 7 times 7 is 49. And if I said, what's the square root of 25? You'd probably say 5. And if I asked you why, you would say 5 times 5 is 25. So when we're taking the square root, we're looking for what number, when we multiply it by itself, what number, when we pair it up, gives me that number 49 or gives me that number 25. So the number that I must have a pair of has to be the number 7, or the number that I must have a pair of must be the number 5. Now, this one here, y'all, has a cubic root. So that means I'm grouping in terms of 3. So look what we're going to do. We're going to take the number 8, we're going to break it down. I know 8 is 2 times 4. But we know that 4 is 2 times 2. So what number do we have 3 of? We have 3, 2. So the cubic root of 8 is the same thing as the number 2. Okay. Okay. So now, the question is saying, is g the inverse of f? So I want you to notice what we did here. For f of 2, we came to our original problem, and everywhere we had an x, we plugged in the number 2, the number we got was 7. Then we took that answer, and we plugged it back into the function g, and we came up with our original value, right, which was 2. So we would say here, the answer is yes, okay? This is the inverse. The idea behind an inverse, guys, it's going to undo what we just did. When we plugged in 2, we came up with 7. When we plug in 7 back into that function g, it undoes it for us, and we come up with the number 2. Okay? So I'm going to show you what an inverse function that is. Okay? So let me zoom in over here. And we're going to take a look, number 1, to make sure that this function is 1 to 1. Okay, so 3 hooks up with 1, 0 hooks up with 2, 2 hooks up with 3, 4 hooks up with 0. In order for the function to be 1 to 1, in terms of when you have points, these numbers here, y'all, cannot repeat. So if you notice 1, 2, 3, 0, they don't repeat. Okay, the way we find the inverse function, y'all, is we're going to switch those points. Where the x used to be, we're going to put the y, and where the y used to be, we're going to put the x. Okay? So instead of 3, 1, I'm going to go 1, 3. Instead of 0, 2, I'm going to go 2, 0. Instead of uh, 2, 3, I'm going to put 3, 2. And instead of 0, 4, I'm sorry, instead of 4, 0, I'm going to put 0, 4. And that's how I find my inverse function. All we're doing is we're switching the x's and the y's. Okay. Now, again, I can only do this, y'all, when my function is one-to-one. -one. And the way I know if my function is one-to-one -one is if my y values don't repeat. If the second number doesn't repeat, then it's one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to look at my function f. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask myself, is it one-to-one? -one? I'm going to look at my y values. And notice my y values repeat. I have two ones and I have two twos in my y values. So there is no inverse function here. Okay. I just can't do it. It can only be done when the y values don't repeat. 
And since our y value is repeated, we just can't do this. Okay. So let me kind of keep moving along here. All right, so now we're going to figure out how do we find an inverse when we're given the equation. Okay. So, guys, the first thing we're going to do when we're given the equation, remember, f of x is the same thing as y. So I know I have my step one, two, and three here. We're going to do like a step zero. So step zero actually is replace f of x with y. Okay. So look, we're going to go like this. Step zero, replace f of x with y. So I'm going to put y equals 2x plus 5. Okay, now we can do step one. Step one says we're going to interchange the x and the y. So what does that mean I'm going to do? I'm going to put an x equals a 2y plus 5. Okay. Step number two says now let's solve this equation for y. Okay, we want to get the y by itself. So first thing, y'all, I'm going to subtract 5 on both sides. So x minus 5 equals 2y. And since I'm trying to solve for y, I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by 2. And then step number 3 says replace y. This little notation here, y'all, the way I read that is f inverse of x. So f with like a little power negative 1 doesn't mean f to the negative 1. It just means f inverse of x. Okay. So step number three, the inverse is x minus 5 over 2. Okay. Now, I want to explain the idea, y'all. What does an inverse do? Okay, let's take a look here. Look at the original function I had. It was f of x equals 2x plus 5. So I'm going to write that over here. f of x equals 2x plus 5. Okay, so if we were to plug in a number, the first thing we would do, so if we were to come back to this equation here, and if we were to plug in a number for x, the first thing we would do is we would say, we're going to take that number and we're going to multiply it by 2. And then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to add 5 to it. Okay. What the inverse does, y'all, the inverse should be doing the opposite thing in the opposite order. Okay? So I want you to take a look at this function right here. If I were to plug in a number for x, if I were to plug in a number for x right here, the first thing I would have to do, I'd have to subtract 5. And the last thing we would do would be to divide by 2. So notice, we did the opposite thing in the opposite order, right? So first multiply by 2, then add 5, undo it, subtract 5, and then divide by 2. That's what the inverse is kind of telling us that we're going to end up doing, okay? So let me come back to my notes. And let's try the same thing for this problem right here. Okay. So remember, step zero is going to be, let's write it like this, y equals 3x over x plus 5. Okay. That's really like the very first step. Okay. Now, step number one, we're going to switch the x and the y. So I'm going to write it like this. x equals 3y over y plus 5. And I'm trying to solve this equation, y'all, for, for the letter y. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to think of this as x over 1 so I can cross multiply. So 1 times 3y is a 3y. And then I'm going to take this x and I'm going to multiply it by both those parts. So that's going to give me an xy plus a 5x. Okay. And all I'm doing is taking this x and multiplying it by the y and x times the 5. And so now I'm going to do the same thing we did before. We're trying to solve for the letter y. So I'm going to bring this term over to the other side. Okay. So those are canceled. 
and I'm going to have 3y minus xy equals a 5x. And then out of here, y'all, I'm going to factor out the letter y. And then from here, since I'm trying to solve for y, I'm going to go ahead and divide everything by a 3 minus x. And at this step, y'all, all I need to do is to write it using the little inverse notation. Okay. And we found our we found our inverse. Okay. So again, first like step zero, y'all, is instead of writing y, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, instead of writing f of x equals, write it y. Step number two, switch the x and the y. Step number three, solve it for y. And then the last step, use a little inverse notation like that, okay? All right. So it looks like we've got one more here. Let's see if we can figure this one out. So, okay, I'm going to do it over here on the side, y'all, because I'm running out of room a little bit. So I'm going to put y equals 7x minus 3. Okay. So y equals 7x minus 3. And then remember, I'm going to switch the x and the y. And number two, I'm going to start solving for y. So I'm going to add 3 to both sides. So x plus 3 equals 7y. And then we'll just divide both sides by 7. y equals x plus 3 over 7. And then my very last step is write it using the little notation for inverse. Again, y'all, this little symbol here just means f inverse, okay? So it's not like f to the power. I know it looks like f to the negative 1. That's the way we write it, but it just means f inverse, okay? All right. So uh, let me continue here, y'all, with chapter 4, 4.1. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can see this better. And it says, use the table for f of x to find a table for f inverse of x. And identify the domains and the ranges of f and f inverse. Okay, so look, we're going to do two things first. We're going to find the domain and the range of our function f. Okay. So just in case you forgot, y'all, the domain refers to the x value. So my x values here are 0, 3, and 6. And my range refers to the y values. Those are 0, 9, and 36. Okay. And now it says, can we make a table for f inverse? We actually can. And I'm going to show you the easy, breezy, coverable way of doing this. So the, the function and the inverse, y'all, are just sort of the opposite ideas of each other. So where these values here used to be my f of x, those are now going to be my x values. And where these used to be my x values, those are now going to be my f of x values. Okay? And so now when I say, look, let's find the domain and the range of f inverse, the domain is now going to be 0, 9, and 36. And the range is now going to be 0, 3, and 6. And that's all I'm doing to find my domain and my range. All right, so I'm going to keep scrolling along here, y'all. And it says, uh, let's see, use the table for f of x to find a table for f inverse of x. Find the domain and the range of f. OK, this is just like the one we did right now. So let's do the same thing. We're going to go f of x, and we're going to say, what's our domain? 
and what's our range, right? So again, remember my domain are my x values. One, two, three. My range are my y values. Four, six, and eight. And now when I make my table for f of x, or f inverse, I'm sorry, I'm just going to switch them. This is going to be 4, 6, and 8. And this is going to be 1, 2, and 3. Right? And then when I say, okay, what is my domain here? My domain is 4, 6, and 8. And my range is 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so guys, the main thing I really want you to notice is that the y values in my f of x become my x values in my inverse. And my x values in my original function become my, my y values in my inverse, okay? So let's take a look-see at the next problem over here. Here we go. Okay. So it says, use the table, or use f of x to complete a table for f inverse of x. Okay. So remember what we said, that the y values in the original function become the x values in the, in, the, in the new one, right? Okay, so we don't have a table for f of x. We have what the equation is equal to, but we don't have a table for it. But we know that these values here, y'all, if we had a table, would have been the y values that we would have had over here, right? So what we're going to do for each of these problems is we're going to take this part right here, x plus 3, and we're going to set it equal to negative 3. We're going to take x plus 3. We're going to set it equal to 0. We're going to take x plus 3. We're going to set it equal to 3. And we're going to set x plus 3 equal to 6. And then we will find the values that are going to go right in there. Okay. So let's take a look at the first one. So right here, y'all, to get rid of the plus 3, I'm going to go minus 3. And let's see, minus 3, minus 3, negative 6. That's the number that I'm going to put right here. Okay. And same thing here. Look, I'm going to go minus 3 and minus 3. Those are going to cancel. Uh, 0 minus 3, negative 3. That's going to be the number that I'm going to put right there. Okay. Do the same thing over here. I'm going to go minus 3 and minus 3. These are going to cancel. 3 minus 3 is 0. That's going to be the number that I'm going to put right there. And I'm going to go minus 3 and minus 3. These are going to cancel. 6 minus 3 is going to give me 3. And that's going to be the number that I'm going to put right there. Okay, it's supposed to be a 3. Okay. So now, let's keep scrolling here. And taking a look at this problem here, y'all, it says, use a table to evaluate g inverse of 2. Okay. When I'm trying to find g inverse of 2, let me tell you what this means. This means, this means let's find the x value when y equals 2. So remember, y'all, the second values, the second part, are going to be my y value. So when I'm trying to say, let's find the x value when y equals 2, we're going to come over here. Here's y equals 2. So g inverse of 2 is the number 3. That's what that means. Okay? So the inverse tells me when you got a y value of 2, what x value sent you there? And we say, well, the x value sent me there was the number 3. Okay. And let me see. Is that it? Is there more? And that's all of, of uh, 4.1, y'all. Okay. 
so we'll probably call it a day there, y'all. And and then next week we'll continue with uh, 4.2, which is exponential stuff and that kind of good stuff. So one thing I'll recommend, y'all, those of you who are here and those of you who are at home, between now and Tuesday, I would definitely recommend try to go through what do we still got to cover? We got to do four two rules of exponents and four three. So I would definitely encourage you to try to do as much of that as you can on your own, so that next Tuesday I can answer as many questions as we have time for. And then I mean I can cover new material as well, but I would definitely like to make sure that I'm able to answer as many questions as I can. Okay. So uh, remember, y'all, the homework is not due this Thursday, but it's due the following Thursday, right? Which is going to be like November the fourth, I want to say. So if I look at my calendar, yeah, November the 4th is when everything here is due. Let me stop recording this.